Good evening, this is Quintus Curtius. Welcome back to the podcast. And this podcast is the third and final lecture in a series of three lectures that I have done on my translation of Cicero's On Moral Ends, De Finibus. And there were two of them already previous to this one where we discussed the different books in On Moral Ends. This uh, lecture is going to be about the fifth and final book, book five of On Moral Ends, in which the speakers debate the merits of the uh, academic philosophy of Antiochus of Ascalon. Now, there are probably listeners saying, who the hell is this guy? Who is this guy? I've never heard of him before. Well, let's talk a little bit about Antiochus and describe a little bit about who he was, what his views were, and related subjects. First, the first thing is we need to understand here, and this is something that is not really known except by those who are students of, uh, of, of philosophy, is that when we say academic, when we say academic philosophy, what I'm referring to is Plato's Academy. Okay, academic doesn't mean anything, you know, universities or uh, scholarly or anything like that. That's that's an adjective that has a modern meaning. When I say academic, it should be interpreted to mean academic with a capital A and specifically referring to the academy, the academy of Plato. And, you know, something that, that you need to understand is that the academy was founded by Plato in ancient times, and like any institution, it evolved over time. It existed for hundreds of years. It was probably only closed probably during the reign of Justinian uh, in the 500s, 500, 530 AD or so. I'm not sure, I don't remember the exact date, but uh, it, it, it survived for, for many hundreds of years, close to 800 years. And so, of course, of course, during that time, it underwent uh, phases of evolve of, of evolution. It evolved o- over time, and the general consensus now is that it it in Cicero's day it had by Cicero's day it had evolved through three distinct phases. The first phase was the old academy, the old academy phase, which uh, and when when scholars date the evolution of the academy, they they go by the who was the head of the school, the scholarch was the title. The heads of the old academy were Speusippus, Xenocrates, Polemo, and Crates. And um, this period covered roughly, you know, 340 BC to 266 BC. And I talk about all this in the in the book's introduction. Actually, I'm looking at page 34 here of the book. If you want to refer to that, then there was a middle academy period. After the old academy, there was a middle acad- middle academy period, which began with the appointment of Arcesilaus as scholarch around 266 BC and ended around 160 BC. And Arcesilaus uh, steered the academy to a sort of a skepticism that emphasized the human inability to really know absolute truth with certainty. Now the new academy phase, the the final phase by Cicero's day, uh, began around 155 BC with the elevation of Carneades as scholarch, okay? And this was the school to which Cicero himself belonged, if we assume that his eclectic tendencies allow him to even be linked to a specific school. And um, this is the one that concerns us here. Now, Antiochus, Antiochus was an interesting figure. He lived from around 125 BC to around 68 BC, and he's an interesting figure. He's not very well known now, modernly, but he was very well known in his time. His, he's interesting because he tried to reconcile the, the views of the Stoics and the Peripatetics, or the Aristotelians, with traditional Platonism. I mean, he, was a, he was a Platonist, but he tried to synthesize the views of other schools and reconcile them to his own ideas. So uh, this is someone who is probably an original thinker in his own right. You know, someone who was an original thinker in his own right. And he had a lot of adherence in his time. I say in the introduction that 
Uh, it's regrettable that his writings have not survived because he was held in high regard in his day. He even seems to have given instruction in, in Egypt, in Alexandria, and in Syria, where he probably died. And, you know, I've touched on this before. The influence of the classical philosophers, the Greek and Roman philosophers, on the ancient Near East is something that really needs a lot more study. I really get the sense that the Greek and Roman philosophers had very close contact with the Near East in some ways. And this level of diffusion that went on between the two parts of the world, um, again, I, I think is very interesting. I mean, I, I've said before, Stoicism possibly originated in the Near East or was influenced by it. And who knows, really? I, I think, I, I guess it gets back to the idea that I think ancient peoples had more contacts with each other than we generally appreciate. We We like to... For our own convenience in writing books, we like to sort of separate things and categorize things, but in many ways there was mutual overlapping interests and, uh, and areas of coverage among the different parts of the world here. Again, we can't take that too far. You know, we can't, I'm not, uh, I'm not willing to take that idea too far like some people do, but there does seem to be a, a interesting level of, of, um, of uh, mutual borrowings from from the Near East, from from uh, you know uh, the, the Fertile Crescent area, what is now, now today uh, Lebanon, uh, Syria, and also Egypt, also with the the Greco-Roman world, at least when it comes to philosophy. In any case, in any case, this is the the the, the philosophy of Antiochus is the one that we're going to deal with here in the fifth book of On Moral Ends. All right. So this, the fifth book is really a disquisition of his philosophy, and it takes place at a different time than the other two dialogues in the book. Uh, this one dates, dates back to an earlier period. It's, um, I think, 79 BC, at an earlier period in Cicero's life when he was a student in Athens. And I can't help thinking that when Cicero was writing book five, he was uh, sort of reliving his fond memories of Athens, of his time as a student there in Athens. And, you know, I visited the grounds of the, uh, the, the ruins of the, of the grounds of the academy uh, in, uh, in August of, of this year, 2018, and, and, the, and the photographs are in the, in the translation. You can see them there. And I had a, a very, very nice time doing that uh, because I felt as I was walking the grounds, I was reliving in my own mind the conversation that's in book five and the different positions of the speakers. And, and, you know, book five opens with a very, very nice evocative description of Athens. Um, you know, there's a description of the, the, the Dipilon gate, one of the, 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 the main gate that used to be an entryway into the city. And I visited that, that area too. It's in a, it's in a part of Athens called the Keramekos cemetery. And it's a, it's a very bizarre place. It's a huge uh, cemetery, frankly, of, of ancient, you know, a, uh, ancient antiquities. And the gate, the ruins of the gate itself, are also there in the cemetery. And this this gate, the Dipilon Gate, was a huge gate. It covered around eighteen hundred square meters. It had four towers. And uh, you know, the Athenians even conducted commercial activities within the 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 atrium area of of the gate so it's a it's very it was constructed around the same time as the walls of Themistocles around 478 BC I think and the stones are still there and you can go and see them and it's just a very very grand feeling to be able to just to be standing in these places to be standing in these places and looking out over these ruins as you uh, evoke in your mind these the words of, of these uh, classical texts, at least for me it is. And what, what really made the, the cemetery visit very, very strange and surreal was the entire area is inhabited by turtles, tortoises, like these large land turtles. And I, I'm, I, I know it sounds very bizarre, but it's, it's a fact. And as you walk around the ruins of, of the cemetery, you see these large tortoises crawling around. And I guess they 
they like the shelter of these tombs. They go inside the cool uh, shelter, the shade of the tombs, and they, I guess they reproduce or rear, rear their hatchlings there. But it lends a very, I don't know, a very, very strange uh, spiritual element to the whole scene that uh, really has to be seen to be believed. And that's really why I encourage people, you know, if, if there's one thing that I hope people will, will do besides read the book and, and study the philosophy in the book is maybe try to go and visit some of these places. Go to Athens yourself if you get a chance. Visit these places. See what's there. And then you will understand uh, what I'm talking about. And you know, it'll mean whatever it means to you. Everyone gets something different out of travel. What something might mean to me may be something very different from what it means to you. So don't just take my word for it. Go and see for yourself these places, if you can, if you're so inclined. Uh, but hopefully the photographs that I've included in the book will stimulate you to, to your own um, motivation to, to, uh, to explore. All right, so let's talk actually about the content of Book 5. And, um, you know, a little bit of pre preamble here when the dialogue starts. Again, as I've said before, Cicero studied in Athens as a young man in 79 BC. And by that time, the city's glory days from 400 years earlier were, were long gone. But Athens had still aged very nicely. It had the character of what we might today call a, a university town. And again, the the, the main one of the main speakers uh, of Book Five is uh, uh, Piso. His full name is Marcus Pupius Piso Calpurnianus, and he sets the helps set the scene of the dialogue by walking on the academy grounds himself. And he's the main speaker, and he talks. He begins to talk about the various aspects of the um, the peripatetic system. And he says that an appropriate end of goods must take into account human nature and our fundamental instincts. And this is in uh, Book 5, Section 15. And he concludes by noting, he, he explores you know, various possible theories of the end of goods, but he concludes by noting that virtue must play a role, must play a critical role in any such, uh, in any such theory. And there's a quote here that I want to read uh, to you from uh, Book 5, Section 22, which really sums it up. And here is what uh, Piso says, and this is uh, page 296 of the translation. I'm looking at the paperback version. He says, Any conception of the ultimate good that lacks the element of moral goodness simply cannot be consistent with right duties, the virtues, or friendship. Linking moral goodness to pleasure or to freedom from pain brings about the precise moral corruption that such linkage is intended to prevent. To try to use two parallel standards of conduct, one of which says that the absence of evil is the ultimate good, while the other remains focused on the shallowest part of human nature, is to tarnish, or perhaps even desecrate, all the splendor of moral rectitude. And this is an important sentence, I think, because this is this is really it's it's Piso talking, but these are really Cicero's, in my view, opinions. And what he's saying here is don't mix, don't don't make virtue, don't make the ultimate good dependent on um, you know uh, freedom from pain or pleasure. Because when you link it to those things, you undermine it. You undermine it. We have to see virtue or the ultimate good as something uh, pristine and pure unto itself. It does not need any qualifiers. It doesn't need any linkage to anything else to assure its validity and strength. You know, to say it, to say it another way, we can say that moral rectitude does not need assistance. It can stand on its own and shine on its own merits. And anyone who tries to do so desecrates the beauty of moral rectitude. And then he goes on, Piso goes on to say that, that the best theory of the end of goods is one based on a life lived in accordance with human nature and developed to its fullest extent. And this is Book 5, Section 26. Uh, you know, Self-love and self-preservation are universal, and moral goodness represents the highest component of our nature. Our chief good, our ultimate good, should be to perfect our nature to its greatest extent. And this, I think, is a very, very important concept. Again, this is 
Book 5, Section 44. I'll reread the point of that, that section again. Our chief good should be to perfect our nature to its greatest extent. And let's go to Section 44 here and see what additional quotes we can read off here that, that emphasize this. And he says this, One must therefore probe into the heart of things and see with unobscured clarity what the features of this inner nature truly are. For, it, for if it were any other way, we would not be able to know ourselves, because this precept was considered too elevated to have come from a man. It was attributed to a god. Thus the Pythian Apollo admonish us, admonishes us to, quote, know ourselves. Yet the only way to gain this knowledge is to understand the power of the body and the mind, and to live the kind of life that permits the full development of their capabilities. So we've got to live a life that allows for the fullest possible development of our bodies and our minds. And that really is a great, great point to, um, to make. Now the virtues, according to Piso, spring from reason, and they're desirable for their own sakes. Okay, Virtue itself is enough to provide a happy life, but we cannot say that the goods of the body are negligible. And this is an important point, and I want to you know, state that again very, very strongly. This is um, Book 5, Sections uh, 71 and 72. Piso says that, yes, virtue may be enough to provide a happy life, but look, the goods of the body matter too. You know, we can't just say virtue, like the Stoics, that virtue is everything and the body doesn't matter, the mind doesn't matter, virtue is everything. Well, you know what? The, <laughs> Piso's point is, hey, look, you know, the body matters too, at least in the short term. So, you know, again, it's. I think it's in, in many ways, I think uh, Antiochus's views uh, are very healthy. I think they're very balanced. They're very healthy because they do, they do not have the severity that maybe the Stoic views often could be taken to have. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a very good uh, couple sections here in, in, in Book 5, sections uh, 78 and 79, where Cicero, who also was a speaker in this, uh, this, this uh, conversation, Cicero and Piso tussle over whether virtue alone is enough to provide a happy life. So go and read that. That's that's uh, sections 78 and 79 in book 5. And uh, a very, very enlightening section there. Piso says it is, but Cicero has his doubts. And, you know, I think some of the most moving, some of the most moving and eloquent passages in book 5 are found in the closing sections, uh, sections 90 through 96, where Cicero really discusses the transcendence of, of virtue. And I'm going to read a few of those quotes because I find this stuff so, so inspiring. In uh, section 91, he says, But here your objection may be, a life that has some element of evil cannot be happy. According to that logic, a field crop cannot be called a rich and fruitful harvest if you see a single tuft of wild grass in it somewhere. Neither can a business be called successful if amid fantastic profits there are some unremunerative transactions. But there, is there one standard valid for every situation, but a different standard when it comes to life? Won't you, judge an, won't you judge an entire life by evaluating most of it, rather than just a part? Is there any doubt that virtue is the central actor in the majority of human activities, to the extent that it overshadows all other variables? Therefore, I will go out on a limb, and call the other things that are in accordance with nature goods. I refuse to strip them of their old names and pin some new label on them, but I will place the weight of virtue on the other plate of the balance scale. And believe me, that scale's plate will outweigh land and sea. The nature of an entire thing is known by that which forms its largest part and is most extensively distributed within it. And then, finally, in uh, section 95, I, I just very much like like this quote here, uh, Cicero tells us, This then is our doctrine. To you it seems contradictory. Yet the divinity and transcendence of virtue is so great that despair and distress can never flourish whenever virtue, wherever virtue and the great deeds and glorious acts done in its name are found. And even though toil may yet exist and hardship may yet exist, one must say with all confidence that every wise man is always happy but it may be that one is happier than another.
and this is a great way to uh, to frame to to frame the argument. And you know, as we um, as we go through Book Five, as we encounter more and more of uh, uh, Piso's arguments, which is really the arguments of Antiochus of Ascalon, we're left with the impression, I think, that Cicero really preferred a philosophy that was grounded in the importance of wisdom and virtue, just like all of his other books. We saw the same thing in On Duties. We saw the same thing in, in Stoic Paradoxes. He wanted, uh, he wanted a philosophy that was grounded in the importance of wisdom and virtue, but that was not so doctrinally inflexible as to be unable to cope with life's changing practical difficulties. And that's really something we have to take away here. Cicero, Cicero was a practical, a practical man. I mean, really, when you look at his philosophy, it, it, it always reverts back to wisdom and virtue. And he emphasizes these things, these things over and over and over again in different ways. And he, and he does it in different ways to tease out all these little nuances of what is wisdom and what is virtue and what are the different perspectives we can look at it from. But he never really deviated from his practicality. And I think this is something that we really need to um, to appreciate. Um, so th- that's that. I think is a is a good introduction, a good overview to Book Five. I don't want I don't want to drown you in too much detail. In these in these lectures, I've tried to keep the um, you know the, the the weight and the burden of the of all the details are for you to explore and discover. And you can you can find the book. It's on Amazon now. Um, I'm going to be getting an audiobook version out of it in a few weeks, whenever that's prepared. But uh, for now, you can find the um, you can find the audio. I'm sorry, you can find the, the Kindle and the paperback versions on Amazon, and go through it, and really try to ask yourself, uh, what do you think? Say, so, so what what do I think? Again, I've I've added my own commentary to to each book after after I've have my translation, then I have a commentary. But, you know, don't take my word for everything. Don't just take my word for it. What I want you to do is I want you to think, uh, to, to form your own judgments, your own thoughts, and wrestle with these ideas. Chew them. Gnaw on them. Turn them over in your mind. You know, turn them over in, in your mind. And um, and uh, one of the, it's funny, I just, one of the actual literal meanings of the Latin verb vertere is to turn over. You know, turn it over in your mind and wrestle with it and see what you what you come up with, because I, I think it's very important to ask uh, questions uh, like this when you're reading this kind of a, a, a philosophical classic. And trust me when I tell you that if you have the endurance, if you have the patience, the endurance and the interest to work your way through these five books, which is not that hard, it's not that daunting of a task. I try to make it as enjoyable as possible with the you know, photographs and commentaries and, and uh, different th- features in the book. But if you can do that, it will stay with you forever. And even if you don't get everything on the first pass, even if you don't uh, acquire, uh, you don't get every little detail, don't worry about it. Do not worry. Do not worry. Your mind will, will take a mental note of it. And as you get older, later on in life, you will come back to it. You'll put it on your bookshelf and maybe once a year or once every six months, you'll pick it up and you'll you'll open it up, up at random and you'll find new things that you had never seen before. Things will start to sort of agglutinate over time. So don't un- underestimate the the uh, the effect of this, uh, uh, you know, the reality of this effect. So that will conclude this lecture, the, the third and final lecture of uh, On Moral Ends. If you have any questions, feel free to email me or put them in the comments section of this post that's going to go up on my uh, website, qcurtius.com. And I'll also put a link in there to the book where you can get it uh, and find it there. All right. I'm Quintus Curtius. Uh, Good night.